Sunday, April 19th, the first Sunday after Easter, the first Sunday of Easter time is what we call that. Um, and I really want to say a word of thanks to Rob Manis and Steve Bates for sharing their wonderful musical gifts. Um, it's funny, as I talk to some of you during the week and run into you out uh, walking and whatnot, many of you have told me how much you enjoy watching worship in your pajamas with your coffee. So I'm going to try not to think about that's what you're doing right now. <laughs> But it's great to be with you. Um, I'm going to begin with a special Easter prayer, and then we'll have our opening song. Alleluia! How can we express the profound joy in our hearts? You, Holy One, you are the one who rolls away the stone and empties the tomb and rises from hell to proclaim life and love and justice and peace. Alleluia! With the women we run to share the joy of this day. With Peter we swim to the shore to taste the mercy of divine love. With the disciples on the way to Emmaus, we see you in the breaking of the bread. Alleluia! Fill us with faith that will not take death for the answer. Fill us with love that will not allow defeat. Fill us with the ways of justice that will not quit when redemption seems so far away. Fill us with peace that uh, perseveres when brokenness and violence swarm. Today, we live resurrection. Today, we sing and shout and pray, Alleluia! 
Christ is risen. Glory to God. And amen. Is this a Keith Green song? It is a Keith Green this song. All right, let's do this. any joys or concerns you want to share with the congregation on the Facebook live feed and we'll be able to see those there um, and we'll collect those later and include those in our updated prayer list but just the things that I'm aware of that I want to continue to lift up and, um, and I'm not going to unpack every one of these uh, situations I'll just lift up these names and, and ask that you pray for Christy Borner, Linda Jolly, Ann Myers, Lois Brazel Tom Day, Susie Kelp, Daniel Manis. Um, I want to lift up Lee Crane's mom, so that's Sue Crane. A tornado hit her house in South Carolina, and uh, they may be watching online. Uh, Jenny Crane is there uh, with Sam. And also want to lift up uh, Jenny's aunt Alice, who's in the hospital It seems to be having seizures. Uh, my mom is in the hospital, and she has a fever and uh, an infection and is uh, really not doing well. And it's been really hard because we can't go see her, like most of uh, the people who are in the hospital or nursing homes. Uh, but a joy is my dad turns 80 years old today, and we were able to have a Zoom uh, birthday party with him last night. Uh, I want to continue to lift up Corp Schumacher, who turned 90 last week. Um, and then there's many families who are, uh, who, who are in a, a time of grief and loss, especially want to lift up the family of Dick Shermoen. Uh, that's the father of Rich Shermoen. And um, pray for their whole family and his passing. Uh, it was expected, but still very difficult. Um, Nancy Pullman, that's Sherry Hammond's mom. Um, the family of Vera Abel, C.R. Worthing, and Orwin Havenstein. Um, I'm sure there's other joys or concerns that are on your hearts. Those are the ones that I'm aware of at this point. I want to continue to pray for our community, for our state, for the country, for the world. 
as we deal with this pandemic. Um, we're hoping that we're bending that curve, flattening that curve, and things are heading in the right direction. Let's keep praying about that. Let's keep doing the right things to make that happen, uh, especially so we don't overwhelm our healthcare workers in the hospitals. So grateful for those who are on the front line. Uh, when you see the numbers of them who are, who are contracting COVID-19, it's, it's really heartbreaking. So we're so grateful for those who are on the front line as healthcare workers, and let's all do our part uh, to show our support and care for them. All right, I'm going to invite you to join me in a time of silent prayer, and then we'll pray the Lord's <coughs> Prayer together. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'll have to say I miss hearing your voices uh, praying the Lord's Prayer. Um, it's wonderful that we can connect through technology, but as you all know, it's just not the same. And, and, and it really stood out to me as we were praying the Lord's Prayer. I just want you to know how much I miss you and I love you. Uh, and look forward to the day when we can all be together and, uh, and just see each other in, 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 in person. Um, all right, I'm going to share a scripture reading from Luke. I, I have a few more sermons that I wanted to share from the Gospel of Luke to finish out this sermon series, so one today and one next week. Uh, this one is the walk to Emmaus that happens after the resurrection. This is Luke 24, starting at verse 13. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles outside the capital of Jerusalem and talking with each other about all the things that had happened. Now while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And Jesus said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still looking sad, and then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only person in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place in these days? And Jesus asked them, what things? And they replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed in word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hope that he was one, the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place, and moreover, some women from our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that indeed they had indeed seen visions of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it was just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how slow of heart you are to believe what the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, Jesus walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it's almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them, and he was at the table with them. He took bread, he blessed it, and broke it, and he gave it to them. Then their eyes were suddenly opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road and while he was opening the scriptures to us? May God bless the reading and the hearing of this word. Amen. Well, the walk to Emmaus from the Gospel of Luke is one of my favorite stories. I just love this story. It's this mysterious encounter with the living Christ 
And I have to tell you, every time I read it, it sparks my imagination. It's a, uh, it inspired me to write a short story, and that's going to be my sermon for today. So let's have a word of prayer to begin. Lord, open our hearts and minds by, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you have to say to each one of us today. Amen. The struggle is real. That's what my wife said to me as we were taking one of our nightly strolls around the small town of Wamigo, just outside the capital city of Topeka. We were discussing the stress and the anxiety caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. We walked, our feet heavy like stones. <coughs> Lost in our thoughts, we didn't even notice the colorful flowers blooming all around us. Grief tends to dull your senses. We needed to get out of the house for some fresh air and exercise. Staying cooped up with six people day in and day out starts to grate on your nerves. We love our family, but sometimes you just need a change of scenery. As, <clears throat> as an introvert, Stephanie had been struggling with the scarcity of alone time, and as an extrovert, I had been struggling with the shortage of social interactions. Strolling down Riverview Drive, I eagerly looked around for familiar faces of friends and neighbors to talk with. Based on the number of people who hurried out of their houses to visit with us, I could tell that there were others who were hungry for conversation as well. Stephanie and I walked down 4th Street towards downtown, and we, sense, we could sense the cumulative effect of the stress building up over the weeks, and it was just kind of stretching us thin. We had so many worries. We were worried about the pandemic, trying to stay informed so that we could do our part to slow the spread and to not overwhelm the healthcare system. We we're worried about our loved ones who are vulnerable, people who are infected with the COVID-19, families who have, who have lost loved ones, we were worried about healthcare workers on the front line who are risking their lives every day to take care of the sick. We were worried about the economy. The suffering is caused by all the businesses that have had to close down and by the millions of people out of work and that loss of a sense of security and stability. We were worried about moving in a few months. A lot of the things are on hold or up in the air, like buying a house, starting new jobs, new schools for the boys. We're feeling a bit unsettled about getting settled in. And let's just say we're not functioning at our best. To be clear, we have many blessings to be thankful for, and we know that. But we also have many worries, just like you do. And someone said to me this week, suffering is not a contest. Right? Like, who has it worse? We all have worries and anxieties and fears, and we have a right to claim those, right? It's not helpful if people just dismiss your concerns as if they're really not that serious. The graceful thing to do is allow people to wallow in the suck, as Molly Scriven said to me this week. I have a friend who says, uh, we play a game, isn't it awful? And then you say, yeah, isn't it awful? Sometimes we just need to do that and play that game. In other words, everyone deserves to have their feelings validated. If you don't remember anything else from this story, I hope you remember that. You have a right and you deserve to have your feelings validated. Now, as a pastor, I know this. I've been through lots of training. I've read lots of books. I've given countless hours of counseling to, to couples and to people about how they should use attentive listening and, and pay close attention. But that doesn't mean that I always practice what I preach. Case in point, I didn't practice good listening skills that day as we were walking past Paramore Coffee feeling impatient and irritable. I cut Stephanie off mid-sentence and I barked out my solution to her problem. And then this tense silence filled the air. As we crossed Lincoln Avenue at the stoplight, the space between us widened as we slowly drifted apart. Now do you recall in the story from Luke that the disciples actually got really irritated with Jesus. As they were walking on the road to Emmaus, Jesus joined the disciples out of nowhere, right? He just kind of silently glided up to them. They were blinded by tears of grief, so they couldn't recognize him. And Jesus interrupted their personal conversation with a nosy question. You remember he said, hey, hey guys, what are you talking about? That's, that's how I kind of imagined it. It's just really grating voice. 
Guys, what are you talking about? One of the, the, one of the disciples, Cleopas, snapped back, Seriously? Are you the only person who doesn't know what's been happening for the last few days? Now, obviously, Jesus already knew what had been happening for the last few days because it happened to Jesus. He knew. But Jesus wasn't there to start an argument with the disciples. I, in, in my mind, I imagine just with compassion in his eyes, Jesus asked a simple question. Will you share with me what happened? And with that question, Jesus opened up their hearts, and he allowed the thoughts and feelings that had been pent up inside them just to pour out. And Jesus listened attentively. The disciples described their overwhelming shock and grief about Jesus' crucifixion and death. I mean, they loved Jesus, and they had such high hopes for his Messiahship. And then the disciples uh, found the, the women's story about Jesus rising from the dead a little less than convincing. I mean, seriously, dead people don't rise from the dead. Jesus listened with patience and care as his disciples expressed their pain and their confusion. And these companions processed their traumatic experience together. As they walked, Jesus asked reflective questions to help his friends make sense of the crisis they were living through in light of Scripture and in light of their faith and their beliefs. What I want you to hear is that when you're struggling with making sense of the world, spend time with the living Christ in word and in prayer. He will listen attentively without judgment. He will bear your burdens and he will give you rest. He will calm your heart and he will transform your mind. The living Christ is the incarnation, right? Love in the flesh. Love in a way that you can see and that you can hear and you can touch. So as Stephanie and I neared the uh, old Dutch mill in the city park, a warm breeze kissed our cheeks. And I could feel the muscles on my face relax. I took a deep breath. I smelled the fresh cut grass. I saw the brightly colored tulips. What a beautiful day. And Stephanie and I came closer to one another and her hand brushed against mine. And we instinctively grasped each other's hands. I felt inspired to try again to connect with my wife. I had assumed what her thoughts and feelings were. I thought I already knew how her day had gone, but did I really? And so I asked her a simple question. Will you share with me what happened? And like a turtle coming out of her shell, Stephanie opened up and shared what was on her heart. We processed our thoughts and our feelings together. We didn't try to fix each other. We shared our burdens, lightening each other's loads. Faithful companions for life. And we made our way out past the cemetery and returned home. We called out to the boys to join us around the dinner room table for supper. Our meal was a gift from some dear friends who could see how exhausted we were, so they brought over uh, homemade chicken enchiladas. We were blessed by their act of kindness. We nourished our bodies and our souls as we ate and we talked together. And then suddenly I recognized all the ways the living Christ had been present with us in the beautiful creation bursting forth with new life, in the loving words shared between my spouse and I as we walked together, in the breaking of bread with loved ones gathered around a table. And I felt my heart burning within me. Amen. The song is called Take My Life. It was written by Scott Underwood, who was part of a great body of music from uh, Vineyard Worship.
Amen. Now, normally this would be the time when we would uh, have the ushers pass out the offering plates and receive the offering. It's an opportunity to respond to God's love, God's blessings, God's word, uh, a way to concretely respond with our tokens of our hard work, right? Giving back from the many blessings we've received. Obviously, we can't do that through technology this way, but you can do it online. So I just want to remind you and encourage you to go online to the church website and you can give there, or you can just mail in your check and that would be great. I want to say a word of thanks to all of you who have been so faithful. Uh, we've had many people add um, online giving. Uh, at least 30% of our giving has been online and the giving remains strong. We're so grateful for that. And we continue to try to use those blessings to serve our community and to serve you. So let us know how we can best serve you. Uh, we are continuing to help people with food and money, uh, the Bible club videos, the, the um, live streaming worship, and then just obviously calling and visiting and uh, checking on our church members. Uh, but we continue to be strong and faithful and we appreciate all of your support. Um, so that's my word on the offering. And now it is time for our big closing and then our benediction. So I'm going to invite you to uh, sit back and enjoy in your pajamas with your coffee, relaxing. Um, one last song called I See the Lord. It's a good one. It's another great uh, vineyard song by Mark McCoy and Andy Park.
Amen. Thank you again to Rob Manus and Steve Bates for sharing their gifts. Ah, that felt great. I hope you're enjoying this at home as well. I hope you have a wonderful week, and I'm going to invite you now to receive this benediction. Live with hope and serve our Lord filled with the Holy Spirit and rejoice always. And may the peace of God guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Have a great week.